My name is Dan Neal. I grew up in southeastern Oklahoma, a little town called Bochito. I uh, grew up on a farm there, 250 acres. And my dad had uh, cattle and hogs, sheep. Then uh, we farmed, raised peanuts and milo and corn, baled a lot of hay. This is a real community. The uh, little town was 600 people. My uh, senior class had, I think, 25 graduating. And uh, from there, I went to uh, college at Southeastern Oklahoma State University. I say, no, it was just Southeastern College then at that time, wasn't it? In Durant for two years and then transferred up to Oklahoma State University in Stillwater. I felt like I had a really good childhood and a loving home, and I had my cats and my dogs and the older brothers carried me around a lot when I was, when I was a baby. <laughs> my dad came out of the depression and he was very frugal, him and mom. Uh, dad grew up and was born in Indian Territory back before Oklahoma became a state. And uh, my mother grew up in, uh, near Joplin, Missouri, a uh, town of Nevada, if I recall correctly. Family had an emphasis on making good grades when you was in school but at the same time you worked. You always had chores to do before you went to school and then you had chores to do when you got of an evening. And, and I remember many times I, when we were farming, I'd get off the bus at the field and get on, take dad's place on a tractor and he'd walk in and start another project. We never felt like we were rich or anything, but we were never hungry and, and we raised a lot of our own food. We killed our own beef and we killed our own hogs and we uh, cut those up on a, dining room table, and uh, so I had butchery experience from, from a very young age, and my dad was a good butcher also. During World War II, he raised and sold the meat off the hogs. Meat back then, they were telling me, was, you had ration cards and you could only buy so much, but uh, that was one of the things that uh, dad grew and, and fed the community with. When I uh, started out at, at uh, Southeastern, it was basically general studies. My intentions of going into uh, uh, mechanical engineering. And uh, then when I went to Oklahoma State, that's what I started in up there was mechanical engineering and had some classes that overwhelmed me. And when that happened, I withdrew from college and that's when Uncle Sam come calling and he sent me this little letter in the mail that says, greetings. And uh, so uh, I was drafted into the army. At that time, it was during the Vietnam conflict, and so uh, I did my uh, basic training at Fort Polk, Louisiana, sent me to my advanced training at Fort Eustis, Virginia, and, and they uh, recognized my mechanical ability and, and sent me to, to uh, helicopter crew chief school, which really interested me. I always had an interest in uh, flight and airplanes. Uh, we had a neighbor that had a little Taylor craft and he had took me flying a few times in that Taylor craft and that tied in with something I had definitely had an interest in and but back then I was back in a classroom I knew what I needed to be doing and I was interested in what I was studying and uh, so uh, I not only graduated at the top of my class but I also had the highest average grade point of anybody been through that school at that time and uh, I had me a big letter from the colonel and all that stuff uh, stating all that, but, um, you know, it didn't mean anything of rank and money goes, but it uh, it felt good that that I had excelled at, at doing that on something I never had had done before. So, other than mechanical, you know, you're growing up on a farm, well, you worked on everything, uh, from the pickup and truck to the tractors and farm equipment. But, you know, we didn't grow up in, in uh, southeastern Oklahoma on a farm learning about combat. Oh, at the time, it was one of those situations where I really didn't want to be there. But at the same time, my focus then was to do the best job I could at, uh, at what I knew how to do. And uh, I flew, flew just about every day when I was there. Flew with the Major a lot and command and control, uh, Charlie Charlie they called him. 
Uh, he was a very uh, trustworthy officer. I really enjoyed being around him. Uh, I never did see him after I got back into the States, but uh, he was a guy that uh, that was a good leader of men. As, as rank goes, uh, when I got to that point and when people seen my abilities, well, I, I advanced in rank as quick as probably anybody could. But, uh, and it's one of those things that was, this was my job, this is what you do, this is what we're here for. Didn't question day-to-day -day operations, you just, you just had to go do your job. And, uh, and so then when you look back on it after you get out and you look back, well, you wonder sometimes, well, what did we accomplish? And why am I still here? And some of my other brothers aren't. Uh, that war affected every community as I've been around the country after I got back. Every community in the United States at some point in time, from somebody, we, I lost a high school classmate over there. He was killed there before I came over. And then later on doing some research, and I didn't know where he was or where he got killed at and stuff, but I was in that same area uh, you know, of where he was too, flying. We lost 58,000 people over there too. And my unit, we lost seven people while I was there in my unit. Back then, uh, in order for us, the airlines provided, because of the war going on, uh, a um, cheaper way of flying, and they called it military standby, but you had to wear the uniform, uh, which was not a good thing at that point in time. But uh, I, I went to Vietnam in uh, July of 69, came home in August of 70, Flew out of SeaTac, uh, uh, the Seattle Tacoma Airport. Didn't have a problem there. Come down to Denver and no problem changing planes and get to Oklahoma City, my home state, which I always considered was a very patriotic state, and get accosted by people in uh, airport in Oklahoma City. You know, and of course, all they knew was the propaganda. They didn't know anything about what went on. To uh, be called a baby killer at that point in time rubbed me the wrong way. And uh, I didn't tolerate much of that off of people back then. So as a result, my uh, wife wondered what happened to the guy she sent to Vietnam. It took me a long time to learn to deal with the memories of war. You block a lot of the ugliness of those things out. And, but you know, realizing that there's more to life and and uh, so you want to teach young people to uh, grow up and be responsible and and uh, and the, what's most important in life is, you know, your family, your family, your friends and and uh, and that's what uh, I think this is what that's what this life's all about. And those kind of things lead us into different things. I found out a few years ago our unit in Vietnam had a, what they call a gathering periodically, and I didn't find out about that till oh, what was it, 15 years ago or so, and I was always involved in something else, and so I never did get to go. And, and so a couple of years ago we met, I went with them to Branson, Missouri, and met them up there, and there was one guy that I served with in Vietnam there, and and uh, he had come back, and him and his wife, uh, they lived in California. And so I got telling stories about him. His wife says, well, I never have heard that story. <laughs> and, and Tim says, well, I don't tell that dumb stuff on myself. And while I was there, I, he and I were together a lot. One day we were up north of Pleiku, and I think it was Doc Toe. And uh, we were getting shelled by, you know, they called them 121 millimeter rockets. Some of them call them 122 millimeter rockets. I don't know what they were, but they make you pay attention. So we, uh, Major, come in, had all the helicopters on the ground, and those rockets started coming in, and they were helicopters sitting there not running. And I told Tim, I said, Tim, let's crank up helicopters. So he and I, I'd, I'd get in one helicopter, crank it up, lock the throttle, he'd get in one, and we just alternated down through there, and we got all the helicopters cranked up and running. 
those pilots that were all over there checking them, looking at the maps and whatever else they was doing, come jumped in those helicopters and took off. And I looked around at old Tim and he and I were the only two left on the ground. <laughs> so anyway, we saw the fight going on over the mountains and our our aircraft were putting in fire trying to uh, to uh, stop the rocket attack and then and, uh, and it quit and, and uh, here comes some helicopters in to rearm and refuel and so we had to go down to the other end of the flight line to uh, rearm. They pulled in the refuel point and the pilots got out and refueled and by that time me and Tim had hustled down to the other end where the rearm point was and they come up there and I jerked the door open the guy says clear the guns we'll get the rockets and so me and Tim uh, cleared two turret weapons and and the pilots replenished rockets and then the next helicopter come up we did the same thing and these two guys here were in Cobra helicopters and so they got no place for us and so we got them redone and they yeah, they were ready to take off, and here come them rockets again. They took off, and there me and Tim was low crawling down this little shallow ditch trying to get away from the refuel, rearm point in case they hit it. So when Tim was sitting there in that ditch and, and watching the Cobras put in rockets on the other side of the mountain, and it wasn't being effective, and he goes to elbowing me. What? And I look around. Look, look, look. And they had these Vietnamese walk in out of the jungle. And they were down probably 50 yards from us or so. I said, are they carrying AKs or M16s? And so they were carrying M16s. They were South Vietnamese, you know. <laughs> uh, and the next thing, well, they'd all gathered up in that ditch with us. They'd walked out of the jungle and they'd got up there and sat down in that ditch with us and watched the show, you know. But uh, there wasn't any of them that admitted speaking a whole lot of English and we didn't speak a whole lot of Vietnamese. But then when you come back, well, I was engaged to my wife and before I went to Vietnam and I chose not to burden her with the marriage till we got till I got out. And so we... Uh, come back and got married and went back to college. Uh, my wife, Marilyn, she experienced uh, some of those things of me adjusting to, to, you know, after I came back. And I remember she still recalls a time when we had a loud noise happen at night and I drug her out of bed and laying on top of her hollering incoming and uh, she didn't understand what was going on. So... Those kind of things you don't, uh, you know, you're glad you don't have to, you don't have to relive again. And it's one of those things of getting adjusted to stuff like that when you're over there. Now we're doing more uh, uh, for our veterans coming back than they did for us coming out of Vietnam uh, because it was not a popular war. And, and why would any war be popular? Now they they seem to be wanting our military to take on a policeman's role instead of a war role and that's just not what the military is all about and it's nothing I wanted to make a career out of and I've got good friends that made a career out of the military and uh, and that's all right too but it's uh, nothing that that I was interested in I wanted to get back into agriculture whether it was farming or taking care of livestock or the way it worked out I end up in the meat business but at the same time uh, you've got uh, feedlots associated with that also. So that was that was my focus. And then our family and our uh, having our two children and, and raising those two kids. And the wife, uh, Marilyn, done a lot more about raising our two kids than, than I did. I tried to be there when I could, but at the same time, it felt like it was my job to do the very best I could to make a living for our family and... and uh, and that was the thing I run into as I've worked people over the years is that's what's really important is uh, you want to provide a good job for them so they can have a good home for their family and, and provide for their family. And so many times in management, it's our job. If we do our job in management uh, right, 
then our, our, our line workers, our people that's working for us and are with us has a much better livelihood. Back then, if you wanted to call home from Vietnam, the only way you could do it was through the ham radio operators. And one year, that year I was over there, my birthday came along, well, Marilyn baked me a fresh apple cake and put it in one of those aluminum cake pans with the aluminum cover on top of it. Slice some fresh apples and laid on top of that and mailed that to me. I remember everybody in the, in my uh, platoon there got a bite of that fresh apple cake and it was uh, quite tasty. <laughs> it got there intact and, and uh, it was very, very good. <laughs> So then I sent her, I sent her, I ordered her engagement ring from the uh, PX and mailed that to her. I also sent her a, uh, uh, some bronze wares that we still use to eat with and, uh, and don't use, that's not an everyday deal, that's only a special occasion deal, we use that. And then I sent her a set of dishes while I was over there that uh, we still have, a set of Makasa China that, uh, that we still enjoy. She's had a lot of challenges in her life too, and and a lot of good things happen. And so we've, uh, uh, when you got a good partner and you work together, well, uh, a lot of good things can happen in your life. All about attitude, keeping that positive attitude, and never thing, and never, nothing's ever going to go always right. So you uh, you keep that positive attitude, and and you work towards the things that important to both of you. Oh, the project I'm involved right now, and, it, and I've had several projects over the years, and, and some have been good and some of them have been not so good, but uh, I have made it a study of uh, uh, time and motion studies around these meat plants in production. And that's what I've done a lot of consultant work with and stuff. But so I come to Morton with some guys that wanted to put in, remodel an old meat plant here in Morton or near Morton and harvest some of our... Um, called dairy cows in this area. I've got the plans already drawn up. I've drawn up the plans for them and they still need to be tweaked and finished. But uh, in the meantime, while they're trying to get the rest of their financing and stuff in place, well, I said, you got a feedlot out there we could be using. And so we've been, uh, they've shipped me in some cattle and so I'm getting the water leaks fixed and getting the bunks cleaned out, formulating rations for the cattle in the feed yard and, and uh, doctoring and this kind of thing. So animal welfare is, is still a big part of part of my life, been part of my life all my life anyway. So if we go ahead and finish the meat plant, if they get their financing stuff available, it'll provide about 200 jobs for this community right here, which will have quite an economic impact on this rural area. And too many times in our rural areas, um, we don't have jobs outside of farming. The product we'll put out out here will be primarily into the ground meat trade, uh, which the United States is a country that uses a lot, that eats a lot of hamburger meat. And then uh, the other big thing we come out of here is a lot of jerky meat, and that jerky industry has, has grown over the years to where there's a lot of jerky consumed. So this is the thing we, we harvest off of these cattle uh, after they've raised the calf or whether it was uh, producing milk. I'm Marilyn Neal, and I am the uh, best friend and wife of Dan Neal. I retired 10 years ago from Texas A&M University Extension Service. I was the county extension agent for Family and Consumer Sciences. Then for my uh, retirement career, I had a uh, catering business in Idaho for 10 years. Well, the first time that I saw Dan, he had just come in from work and he was this tall, cute, blue-eyed farmer from a little bitty town that had fewer people in it than my high school class had in it. And uh, we just became friends for probably the first year or so. We were just friends who de casually dated. And I found that the best person in the world to fall in love with is your best friend because 50 years later, He's still my best friend. We've had lots of fun, exciting adventures and lots of uh, not so fun, exciting adventures, but we've made it through them all together because you can do anything with your best support. And when we first met, Dan probably didn't say 10 words an hour. 
And if he did, you better listen because it was going to be something worth hearing. But when he came back from Vietnam, he had developed a sense of confidence and maturity and with the things that he had been through, a much greater idea of what was really important in life. I grew up in a family that had no combat veterans. So I was certainly taken aback at this big change. What other people did didn't bother him before he went to Vietnam. When he came back, if he didn't like something, you didn't have no doubt. He, he had no qualms in, in uh, bringing up whatever issue that he had. But I knew that deep inside he was, he was Dan. He loved me. I loved him. When we married, we made one commitment that we were only getting married one time. So whatever problems came up, we've worked out together. And we're both very strong-willed people, so sometimes it's interesting working those things out together. <laughs> but uh, I, I really appreciated him in his caring. He was always a very caring person before. He's even become more so. He has helped so many young people, especially young men, find their true way of, of life, what they should do. He is very concerned with veterans of all ages, and has devoted so much time working with them and helping other veterans. Neither of us grew up wealthy, but now we have a, a, some, a lot of young people who just assume that I should have the house that mama had. I should not ever be broke. You know, those are the things that build character. The old saying that character is what you do when nobody's looking well. Unfortunately, sometimes we have kind of let some of our um, younger women, and I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but some of our younger women feel a little more entitled that sometimes we have to just back off and say, I'm here for you because all the really good things don't have a dollar sign on them. Probably some of the happiest times we've ever had in our life we were talking about the other day. We lived in a, in a 12 by 60 foot trailer with, with two babies. And the best thing is having each other. We've moved a lot. That's okay as long as Dan's there. So you have to find that link in your life that helps you be your strongest and him be his strongest.